Hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Wednesdays with Watson podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Pop Fusions. And guys, let me tell you, this is not the popsicle of your youth. No ice cream truck brought this to you when you were a little kid. Pop Fusions gourmet fruit pops are created using locally sourced, honest to goodness, real fruit that is then flash frozen to bring you farm to stick experience. It is a little slice of Florida fun fresh on a stick. You could find them at their shop in Inverness, Florida. You can look for them on the rivers around the Citrus County. You can find them in Times Square. You can find them at Disney World and even at your local beach. You can also order online at popfusions.com where you can also email Kelly, K-E-L-L-I, at popfusions.com. We are grateful to Pop Fusions for their sponsorship today. Head over to their website for more information on this amazing frozen experience on a stick. By the way, all the products are processed allergen free. So whether you prefer fresh fruit with amazing collisions of flavors or you want a little kick and make it a wine pop, head there now and get yours. We are so grateful for their sponsorship. And now to today's show. This is the Wednesdays with Watson podcast. This season is PTSD, Jesus, and you, and this is grieving the loss of a child. Randy told me about his son, Jay. He told me about his vibrant smile, the kind that could light up a room. He told me about his vibrant personality. He describes that day his little boy died as the darkest time of his life. And then he shares the purpose he has created from those dark days. He described that day as normal, as many days that end in trauma are. Little Jay was enjoying a day in the water, frolicking around, enjoying childhood. Randy watched and noticed Jay began to struggle. After pulling him out of the water, Jay began to become very ill. His electrolytes dangerously low and the violence of his illness stemming from an infected appendix. As Jay, as Jay was rolled into the operating room for what should have been a routine appendectomy, two nurses refused to follow the doctor's orders. He was coming off of a 36-hour shift and though never proven, likely under the influence of drugs. After the nurse's refusal, he pushed the clear liquid into Jay's IV, 20 milligrams of potassium. As it would turn out, 10 times the dosage needed to balance the little boy's electrolytes. He immediately suffered cardiac arrest and despite all the efforts of everyone in the room, little Jay lost his life that day. And my guest lost that beautiful smile, that radiant personality. Guys, he lost his child. Today, Randy Mortensen is here, here in the healing zone to share his journey with the loss of his child, that darkest time of his life and how he has turned unimaginable pain into purpose. This is the Wednesdays with Watson podcast. This is PTSD, Jesus and you, grieving the loss of a child. All right, here we are. I am so pleased to welcome Randy Mortensen to our show today. Randy, thank you so much for coming on. I cannot tell you how much I really appreciate this. I know that, that this is a passion of yours and I'm so excited about our conversation today. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, Amy, and, and always appreciative of being a guest um, because you have a lot of choices and, and for some reason I came to the top for today, so that's perfect. Well, I believe that the Lord ordered it. This is a topic that has been heavily requested. And so I had many, many people, um, but the Lord really, when, when you sent me the link to where I could hear your story, um, I could hear the pain still palatable in your voice. And so, again, I just want to thank you. But we're going to dive right into this. Um, so, again, Randy, want to thank you so much for being here. I think one of the first questions that I want to talk to you about is what happened after that? How did you process that? Because this is a podcast about trauma, about PTSD and in those journeys, which are often crooked, crooked roads. And so can you tell us a little bit about like right after Jay died, 
because I think, and I'm not sure, and I do this on purpose, that this might be connected to your passion and your, your passion project and your purpose. And so I'd love for you to, to, to share with my listeners, what were those early days like for you? The, what, what I will often say, Amy, is, is indescribably dark. And, and what, what I will also say to audiences is, is, is my poor choices cost me relationships and hundreds of thousands, probably millions of dollars, but the poor choices of that emergency room physician that day cost me a son. And I don't ever want another parent to go through that because in those days after losing Jay, nothing mattered. Mm -hmm. And and I would walk uh, at the time where I was living in Iowa, and I would walk from our house to the cemetery, just just because my emotions were all over the board, and and I was I was in business at the time. Business didn't matter, and I would just sit at his tombstone, just sobbing uncontrollably, and and so I would I would range from feelings of anger to feelings of just desperation and, and just feeling worthless. And, and at, at that time, I, I, I thought I had faith, but I didn't know what I didn't know from a faith standpoint, sure. basically. And we can talk about that a little bit more in depth uh, later, but it was, it was just the utter, hopelessness of how is my life going to have meaning going forward even that's how dark it was was jay your only child he he was he was my uh, my only child at that time and and i it was my second marriage and it was the second marriage for both of us and so i had two two bonus kids or you know i don't like calling them step kids right but um they were they were in their teens and, and so they had this beautiful little brother and, and they called me dad, you know, the, the, the older brother and sister. And so the devastation for them, in addition to their mother and myself, just created, it, it, it didn't, it created chaos, but not in, the, not in the way that you would think there was a lot of anger being thrown around or, or, or anything like that. It was just so deep the loss that the emotions were were just unexplainable. Yeah, they, they it, really were. And that really is. And I'll ask you this question formally in a minute, but that really is the definition of PTSD, and it really does affect your entire family. Um, and so, um, so here's here's a, you know my listeners know I go for the juggler quickly. Um, where was God for Jay? Well, and that's, that's what I alluded to earlier is, is because I sat in the church every Sunday of my life in, in growing up. And what my testimony is, I didn't know what I didn't know about having a personal relationship with Christ. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so where was God for Jay? Jay was just getting into Sunday school. Jay sat in church with me every Sunday and, and, and yet, I blamed God because the other thing, Amy, that, that I may not have shared previously is six months into my banking career, my dad died of a massive stroke at age 45. Oh, wow. So I had experienced that. And then 12 years later, now I lose my son. And so the other, the other part of my story is, is that I started drinking when I was 13. Oh, wow. And so, so despite, and then what, what I, what I say about that is, is it wasn't so much the drinking that I enjoyed. It was the exhilaration of not being caught. And, and so, so I was a high school athlete. I, I did very well, you know, as a superstar baseball player, went to college to drink beer, chase women and play baseball in any given order, any given day. Right? right. So I was making some poor choices, married my high school sweetheart, and and then my dad died. And and that sent me just off into a whole new path of drinking. 
ended up divorced. This was now my second wife that I mentioned that we now had this beautiful five-year-old son and I was still drinking a good amount, but my business life was always successful. My personal life was just full of bad choices. So what this did is it, it, it compounded the challenges that I had with drinking. Right. And 95% of parents who lose a child end up divorced. Wow. Sadly, I was part of that statistic. 95%. 95% of parents who lose a child end up in divorce. Okay. Wow. And so I, I don't blame anybody else for my poor choices, but with the loss of a child, and here's the other blessing though, is, 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 that we had decided we weren't going to have any more children. Well, as it turns out, despite all of our hurt and pain, my son Joel was born 13 months later. Oh, and the listeners can't see the smile on my face because I, I, I have chills. That's so, right. wow. So, so it's, but the challenge with that is though, Amy is, is his mother and I divorced. Joel, Joel just turned 32, just made me a grandfather just last week. Oh, congratulations. And, thank you. And, and so, so the, the, the pathway that my life took is it took me being far more broken than I could have ever imagined. And I got sober September 24th of 1990. Wow. Okay. So, so I just re- a I just lot of t- re- I was trying to do the math in my head. That's the year I graduated from high school. That's a long That's time. Thirty years. Yeah. That's Thirty years, and and so I'll take you down the faith journey a little more. So I have a forthcoming book titled "God Took Me to Las Vegas to Get Sober." Okay. Love it. And and so I went to Las Vegas and met a beautiful woman. We just recently celebrated thirty-one years of marriage. Wife number three. Okay. And, and so I figured out how to not drink, but it wasn't until, until March of 1992 when I was sitting in, an am, in a ballroom in Orange County, California, and I grew up in the Lutheran church. I did, I'd never seen an altar call, okay? And the gentleman on stage that morning, that Sunday morning said, if today's the day that you feel that you should confess your sins, invite the forgiveness into your life and, and become a fully devoted follower of Christ. Today's the day for you to make that decision. That's when my life radically changed. Oh, I love you know? it so much. So I, so I had had those two huge losses where I was really angry at God, but I, but I would still go to church. And then, and then the, the drunkenness of my life caused me just like I said, millions of dollars, countless relationships. And then God just opened the door for me to be in serving his people, for me to be, to, to be on a path to help that guy or that gal who may be struggling with losses that I have, but it's really the stigma of substance use disorders and mental illness that are holding people back from getting help. You're 100% yeah. right. And that's one of the reasons why I have this podcast is well, docu- it's well documented that I, that I had an opiate um, addiction uh, to, yeah. to deal with my PTSD. Now, speaking of that, because this podcast is on PTSD, I did want to just ask you, were you ever officially diagnosed with PTSD? No, but I, as, as you alluded to a couple of minutes ago, did I suffer from PTSD like Absolutely. Yeah. No, no question. And, yeah, that, and it's, it's undiagnosed. Right. And, uh, yeah. As a, and it's massively undiagnosed, right? And so I always tell people, if you're asking the question, if you're having some of the symptoms, if you're angry like that, if you, you know, if you're having flashbacks and, and a loss like yours is just immeasurable in so many ways, but, but, but it, it is incredibly underdiagnosed. And I tell people all the time, I'm not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV, but I would say that you had PTSD at, at as a result of both of those losses, especially a parent as well. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is we talk about three C's on this podcast and, um, and because they have been, these three C's have been instrumental in my own healing um, as a survivor of 35 years of trauma, ranging from childhood abuse to, to domestic violence. Can you share with me, so we're going to start with the first one, community. Can you share with me uh, the way if, community helped you through that time? 
without a doubt. And, and I'll, I'll just take your that C and, and, and expand a bit on it is because in, in Minnesota, I was, I was blessed to be the founder of a faith-based recovery program. And we launched it on St. Patrick's Day of 05. To date, we've served somewhere around 22,000 people wow. through, through that faith-based recovery program. And what I what I will say in, in 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 you know even speaking from stage is we all need community. It's not a matter of whether we should have it or we shouldn't, because what we gain from community is the unity aspect of it and accountability and everything that goes with that. And so community's been a huge component of my personal growth as well as my my recovery program. Without a doubt, it's all about community. It, it really is, and I and I don't know how any of us can deny that. Um, for for me, it was a you know it was just a group of people that loved me and loved me well, and I too, like you, was making bad decisions. You know, to you know it. Um, it there's an old saying, and I know that you'll identify with this as it as it comes to substance abuse. Um, you know, one is too many, and ten thousand is not enough. And so there are people under the sound of our voice who are Christians who uh, who are suffering and at the end of the podcast i'm going to give you an opportunity to send them to your resources who are suffering as a result of substance abuse and and because it's so shameful then they don't go out into the community but you look at all of the programs this is a faith-based podcast but you look at the successful programs like aa and some of that and it's all steeped in community and so i i i, th I, I knew that you would agree with with us on that um let me ask you this one of the things the other second c is trauma-informed counseling did you ever seek professional help yeah absolutely and, and I will still refer people to professional counseling. Um, when that day that I made the decision that enough was enough, back in, in September of 1990, I was actually on an airplane coming home from a business trip to the Midwest. So if you remember, I was living in Las Vegas. And right. so it was a connection in Phoenix to Las Vegas and I was drunk. And I, I just had to, there was something I remembered I had to get done before I got home. Well, I had two bottles of scotch on my tray table, opened up my briefcase, and I had three bottles of scotch in my briefcase. Wow. And I said, you know, they were airline bottles of scotch, right? So I said, okay, enough. I'm done. I'm quitting, right? And this is before 9-11, so my beautiful wife, met me at the end of the jetway as I came off the airplane and, and she said, Oh, you've been drinking. And I said, yeah, I'm quitting. Today's my last day. I'm, I'm, I'm done. So I did a lot of research and I'm going to affirm something else. You just said, I did a lot of research because I was only going to do it once. I'm just a little stubborn also. Right. I, I'm only going to do it once. And I took a week. I checked out Hazelden, Betty Ford. it didn't matter. I was going to only do it once. Well, ended up in in um, a treatment center in Southern Utah for 28 days. Had no hint what to expect, but it was only through the professionals there that I'm sitting here today. And, and I, the other person that I'll bring up was the first AA meeting I went to was my third night in that residential treatment program. And Oscar was 80 years old. He sat on the corner of the table next to me. He was 80 years old at that time. He had been drinking for 40 years, but he'd been sober for 40 years. Wow. And I, I looked over at him. I said, Oscar, what's the secret? Right. I'm naive. I'm new. Right. What's the secret? He looked at me and he said, young man, I was like 37 or whatever I was at that time. He said, young man, he said, this is the secret. Before you go to bed tonight, get on your knees and thank God for your, for your ability to go to bed sober tonight. And then get up in the morning before you do anything, get on your knees and ask God to give you the grace and the power to get through a day sober. That was Oscar. Okay. And, and so it was, it was really the, the people that, that I was introduced to, but it was the counseling then even the follow up and Here's what I say often. I'm, I don't like to be critical of some of these big business treatment programs. However, here's what many people don't understand. 
seven out of eight people that go to those programs end up relapsing within the first six months of coming out. Yeah. It's okay. very sad. Yeah. It's very so, sad. So did I do counseling? Absolutely. And, and what I will, what I will do is, is I will say to, to a person that asked me for help, uh, I will say to them, okay, if you have a mild or moderate case of substance use disorder, I have programs and I can help you. But if you're severe, I will refer you to some programs that I know have great results. And so, I absolutely. Yeah. And I, and I think that because of your loss, you know, pe people receive that better from someone like you or like me is like, you know what, I've been through it. I've been there. I've been there, done that. And here's right. where you go get help. And that's what happened for me too. Can you tell me briefly a little bit about how the church might've helped you through that time? I love, I loved the visual that you told me that you had never been to an altar call because I grew up in a Baptist church, which I still go to, but that was back in the day when the music director would sing, they would sing until somebody came to the altar. And so that just gave me a really cool memory when you said that, but, but in those years for after the, after, you know, going to Las Vegas to find God and you really knew that you needed to take that 180 and put your trust in Jesus Christ, how has the church um, come alongside of you? Because I, my listeners mostly think the church is a bunch of hypocrites, which we are, a bunch of sinners, a bunch of all kinds of things. But there's also filled with a bunch of people like you and me who really care about people. How was the church for you um, in those days? The, the, the church for me early on wasn't safe, okay? Mm. Because, because it was, I, I think there's, there's a significant amount of judgment that is cast um in 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 the church you know the big c church not the little c church but the right. big building and what there, there's two thoughts that come to my name is 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 suicide rate amongst pastors in the last 18 months is at an all-time high so so it's difficult for leaders of churches to really minister to people like you and me because they're 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 so often it's not safe for them to say i know how you feel i felt the same way and and so that's why my passion has been in the church that, that i started quest 180 up in minnesota that that all started because one of the pastors came to me and he said randy and was in a baptist church he said randy you're an alcoholic right i was like well hold it is this okay for me to say yes right, right? Yeah. Because there's so much stigma in the church and judgment. So has the church been a huge part of my recovery? The answer is absolutely yes. And I want the church and corporate America to be a safe place where they understand people are hurting. And it's not poor choices so much as it is the decisions and the other influences that are causing people to not seek help. Right, and I think you bring up a really good point, which is gonna be a whole nother season for me, but it's from the pulpit, they're not safe to say I'm not okay. Uh, one, exactly of the, right. one, of the yeah. loss, one of the losses that just hit me hard, and I didn't even know the man, had never even heard of them, but Steve Austin, who is a pastor and an author and a mental health advocate, and his book may be on bookshelves now called Hiding in the Pews. But here is a mental health advocate doing what I do that completed suicide. And so, right. I, so I asked that question because I want listeners out there to make, you know, we can make this, the church safe. Pastors all over the country are trying, but if they can't be safe to say I'm struggling, then how are we going to feel safe? And so thank you for answering that as candidly as you did. Um, I do say this to my listeners all the time, not to compare pain and trauma. And even though he was just my stepson, I lost a child too, um, just a couple of years ago, as a matter of fact. As my faithful listeners know, I've been through a lot but that day that I got that phone call was also one of the darkest times in my life because we aren't, we aren't wired to bury children, but for the listeners out there here who might be a little bit earlier in their journey, what advice would you give them? And I'm going to kind of couple that with what do you, so advice and what do you wish you, you knew then that you know now? So somebody's listening to this podcast that just lost their child. Here's, here's, here's one thing that really bothered me early on was when somebody would come up to me and say, oh, I know how you feel. And they, there's no way you can know how 
I feel unless you've experienced what, <clears throat> excuse me, what I'm experiencing, right? So, so I would say to that person who's struggling is be patient with others who genuinely love you and care about you, but they may not be saying things that are appropriate to, to really help you. Yeah. And, and so, so I, I, I coach people on that to say, don't say, you know, how I feel if you haven't felt it genuinely. Right. And, and then where, where I really looked for others to help me was that guy or gal that could say, I know how you feel. I felt the same way. This is the path that I've taken and here's who I am today. And, and I would, I would encourage that person who's listening to this, please don't isolate, please don't, you know, don't fail to reach out to somebody like Amy or myself or somebody that's a trusted advisor in your community, because when we isolate the poor me set in, when we isolate depression makes, brings things even to a darker place. And the other thing I would say is, is really identify those two or three key relationships that you have, whether it's a spouse or a coworker or some, you know, a parent, because there's going to be times when your despair, when your loss is going to be overwhelming and, and be sure to have that safe guy or that safe gal that you can pick up. And, and I refer to myself as I'm that two o'clock in the morning friend. 2 a.m. Right? friends, 2 a.m. 2 a.m. friend. Yeah. And, and so that, that, those, those are the things that immediately come to mind, Amy, is, well, is not isolate and be bold and, and, and confident in reaching out to others. Well, and I love that because when you're doing that, you're leaning into the pain. You and I both inebriated the pain for so long. And so we didn't lean into it. And so the longer we don't lean into it, the, the worse it gets. And so we come back to that word community. And I was thinking as I was preparing for the interview, um, I don't, everybody knows who Tony Dungy is. I live in the Tampa Bay area and he was the coach of the Tampa Bay Bucks for a long time as a Christian loves Jesus. His son completed suicide. And I will never forget when I read his book and I believe it's in quiet strength and I'll put it in the show notes, but he said this quote, Life will never be the same, but it won't always feel like this. Would you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, and, and, and actually, actually, I've been face-to-face -face with Tony. Cool. Um, so, so, yes, and, and there's, other, there's other professionals and, and even, I would say, movie stars. There's probably a better descriptor in today's world, but that have gone through this. And there's a very prominent pastor over in Orlando whose son – was in ministry with him and committed suicide. Yeah. Okay. So, so we, we, would I agree with what Tony Dungy says? Absolutely. We, we need to, we need to know that for such a time as this, God's taking us down a journey. We'll never understand why until that day when we get to go face to face with him. Right. And you gave me he's you're not giving doing me it chills. to punish. Yeah. Right? You're he's not doing it. He's not doing it to punish us. He's not doing it to, to steal from us. But it's part of his plan because back to your question about the church, what it really compelled me to do was Stephen Ministry as a care ministry program that's been around for many years. I went on to become a certified national trainer for Stephen Ministers. So then, so then the church was raising up people to be able to be trained to minister to others. So it's really that community within the church that's yes. also vitally important too. Yeah. And we're going to, and we'll put all of that in the show notes. I'll get that from you on email because that's, in, that's imperative. Uh, you, you really already answered this question, but it's a question I ask on every podcast because I love people's answer to it. But here we go, Randy. Is Jesus the star of your story? No question. Without, without Jesus, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. And, and without that faith, I mean, the, 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 greatest, the greatest compliment anybody could ever give me, and I actually have a class reunion coming up in a couple of weeks. And, and what, what I want people to say to me is, you have changed so much. What, what has caused this radical transformation in your life, right? 
it's only through through the through the love of Christ. Amen. You know, and and and, and without without him, I wouldn't be here today. Without him, I wouldn't have the passion that I have to see lives transformed. So is he the star? No, he's the only, you know, the only star. Amen. Capital ca- capital S star, no no doubt. You know, um, I was thinking as I was interviewing you as we as we come to the close, and I really want you to, to, to take a, a couple minutes to tell, tell us about this huge, cool project that you have happening next year on Jay's 40th birthday. Um, but um, but y- you were, I was thinking about God the Father who had to watch his son die. And, um, and so in some ways, you know, I know that I, and I, and I, and I say the scripture on this podcast all the time, Hebrews 4, 15, that we do not serve a high priest who is unfamiliar with our sufferings. And so you're in good company with God, the father who had to watch his son die. And, and, and for those of you under the sound of my voice, I know not all of you are Christians, but, but, but Randy has lost a child 35 years ago, a a father, uh, tragically, if you've listened to my podcast at all, or any of the stories of hope on my podcast, the thing is, is Jesus, Jesus is the star of your story. He could be that for you. He can give you the remission of your sins. And if you need to know how to know him, I am embarrassingly easy to reach on all social media platforms. Um, and then we'll provide, uh, uh, Randy stuff and the um, and and the show notes as well. But Randy, I want you to also know uh, before before I want you to close us out on talking about Jay's house uh, that you also are living out my life verse, which is Philippians one twelve, where Paul says, "If the things that have happened to me." Uh, that Paul said the things that have happened to me have really happened to further the gospel and what you've done on a Friday afternoon here in, in rainy Florida after a hurricane is you're using uh, Jay's story um, to to proclaim the gospel and you will still enter heaven as my last guest said with tears in your eyes but there will be one day where you'll see Jay again and there will be no more tears no more pain no more sorrow and so you have turned this purpose into pain and recovery programs and we're going to put all of that stuff in the show notes but i want you to take about two minutes here and tell us about jay's house um and what's happening april 15th of 2022 yeah and in in i'll add 12 seconds to that i i I mentioned that i'm a grandfather for the first time like seven days ago and so as i looked in in little oliver's eyes just uh, just four or five days ago i i had tears because I realized that, that this is Oliver. This is a gift. Had I not been sober, I would have never seen Oliver. And, wow. and, and Joel, who's Jay's younger brother, Joel didn't never know Jay because he was born a year after he died. But seeing the gift that only God can give, which is life, right? And, and so what, what I'm doing God's laid it on my heart because we've been doing work in Haiti for almost, well, we're in year 16 now doing work for Haiti. So we have 1,400 kids in our schools. We've, we've got 80 to 90 full and part-time Haitian staff through Worldwide Village, which is our nonprofit. And we're sharing the gospel every opportunity we have. So one of the challenges that young men have in Haiti is they don't have godly fathers for the most part. And and it's 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 a very chauvinistic society so women are mistreated so what there's a model out of omaha nebraska called boys town which takes boys and now girls into uh homes and in and there's a mom and dad so it's a functional loving christian mom and dad and they could have one or two of their own children but with jay's house what we're doing in haiti is we will take in young men between the ages of eight and 18 and have them live in a home with a mom and dad. And, and those young boys will then learn what it is to, to be a Christ follower. They will, they will witness that. They will have an opportunity to complete an education. They will have an opportunity to learn from our agriculture programs that we have. They will have an opportunity to really become I have another program that's called the Lifestyle Champion, and it's a cohort and it's a men's weekend retreat. But I want these young men to become that lifestyle champion that God has put in each and every one of us. And so the house, the house is Jay's House of Restoration. You can go to jayshouse.org and there's more information there. 
I'm raising $82,000. I want to dedicate that home on what would be Jay's 40th birthday, August 15th of 2022. So it's all in honor of him. I so have chills because what you don't know about me is that I grew up in a children's home in Tampa, Florida, where people just cared enough about a bunch of hurting kids. And they did just that. They fed us, they clothed us, they taught us Jesus, they, they, they educated us, and they took what could have been a bunch of kids that, that could have ended up on a very bad road and lots more trauma and lots more pain and turned, us in, turned it into what you're looking at across the screen. I too should not be here. And I'm here because of an endeavor like that. And I will be sure to get with your assistant and make sure we put the the best and easiest links that we can into the show notes for those of you out there haiti has always been on my heart um i i have never been but for some reason haiti and new york city has always been on my heart as and and so i was so happy to hear that you were doing that and i want to be part of helping you raise that money and so we'll absolutely put it in the show notes and so before we close um i just wondered if you had anything else because you have absolutely lived one of the most traumatic events that a human being can and this podcast is about hope and help at the crooked roads of all of those things and so thank you for being here today but 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 before we close out do you have anything else for our listeners out there well here, here's here's what i want your listeners to know is I, I i can say i know how you feel i i i felt the same way here's the path that god took me down and here's who i am today and and i will i will say when somebody says what do you do i say i'm a guide for talented management professionals whose drive has led them down a path of compulsive and destructive behaviors and in some instances, that may be PTSD, it may be other, other life challenges. But my website is, is randymortensen.com. That's R-A-N-D-Y-M-O-R-T-E-N-S-E-N.com. On the front page there is a 21 question assessment that if you or, or one of your loved ones is struggling, it doesn't cost you anything. It's 21 questions that will give you an indication whether you're a mild or moderate or severe case of of some some substance use disorder. I do do a lifestyle champion cohort on a monthly basis. You can go to that website and learn more about that. And I do weekend men's retreats that are coming up in the fall and then and then in the winter, which we start Friday night and they go until Sunday noon. And it's called the lifestyle champion weekend for men. So uh, it's for men or, or their sons, 16 and over. And so I've got a ton of programs, but Amy, I, 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 I need to get you to Haiti with us. I've been to Haiti 180 some times. Well, I need to run years we go every month. I might take you up on that. I need to renew my podcast or, or podcast. Goodness gracious, passport. But uh, but I but I but no, you you captured my heart with it. Well, what I want to tell you today, Randy, is how grateful I am to you, um, and how how unbelievably grateful I am to God who makes all things new uh, Revela- at Revelation 21 5 and, 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 and often quoted on this podcast also is, is Tolkien's quote um, there will be a day when all the sad things become untrue so thank you for being here today um, and we'll make sure we put everything in the show notes and our work together is not done um, no, I, agree. I, I just I agree. love I love what I see across the screen thank you so much for being here with us today thank you thank you Well, guys, Randy's story is a hard one, but it is just another one where hope, hope, capital H, hope has triumphed. As I prepared for this interview, I was reminded of the sovereignty and the faithfulness of God. I know Randy joins many of us when we, when we see the promise of Revelation 21, 5 fulfilled, the day that all things will become new and that all the sad things will come true. Until that time, we're going, to keep, we're going to keep hanging out with you. We're going to keep telling you stories in your earbuds. And I'm going to get behind the mic. And we're going to get in the healing zone. We're going to stay in the healing zone. And that is where I'll see you in two weeks. Just one more episode before the season finale. You guys are helping grow the podcast just by your interaction on all the social media. Those links are in my bio, as well as sharing it sincerely from the bottom of my heart. And so as Bill Baker's song, Marked by You, plays, I think of Randy and how his life is marked by God and how this song is just a true representation of how you can heal from the hurt and pain of trauma. We will see you again here in two weeks in the Healing Zone. So let my life glorify.
fire.